Welcome everyone to the Essex County Field Naturalist Club August meeting. My name is Corey Reno. I'm the club vice president. With tonight's special guest presenter, we have uh, Karen, Karen Alexander. Karen is the policy coordinator for the Invasive Species Center, a virtual nature interpreter for lifelong stories or life song stories. And you probably know her as the uh, current club vice president for the Essex County Field Naturalist Club. In her spare time, uh, Karen works for a nonprofit organization called the Invasive Phragmites Control Center and assists with environmental projects for the township of Tiny. She has over 10 years of experience working with Phragmites and tonight she'll share with us her knowledge on this aggressive invasive plant. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Karen. Karen, it's all yours. Thank you, Corey, and hello, everyone. It's really great to be here um, talking to you tonight about uh, invasive Phragmites. Uh, this has been a fairly common theme for me in my career, so I do have a lot to share. Um, so hopefully uh, this will be as interesting to you as it has been for me. Um, first of all, I'd like to just acknowledge that I'm presenting tonight from my home in Amherstburg, Ontario, traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations. That's comprising the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi peoples, and of the Huron-Wendat and Wyandot people. Tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about Phragmites, as I've mentioned, but just a quick outline. I have a number of slides, a lot of photos um, to share. So just to give you some idea of what we'll go through tonight, background information about Phragmites, uh, some of the characteristics on what makes this thing so aggressive um, and why it's such an aggressive invader, the historical distribution and how it got to the Great Lakes and, and where it's headed, some of the concerns, which I think will um, be uh, not as surprising to some, but maybe to others. And, and then I'll jump into some of the control options. And, and I think this part of the presentation will be quite interesting because a lot of these control options have been created right here in Ontario. Um, and that'll lead us into what some of the, the larger initiatives on the underway in Ontario, uh, which I call Ontario's uh, fight back. So, this photo has been circulating for years. Uh, it's kind of famous in the frag world. Um, this is Phragmites australis. Uh, this is the aggressive invader, giant reed, common reed, call it European reed is the actual common name. This species or, or Phragmites is actually present on every continent on the planet except Antarctica. And in Canada, when we do talk about the invasive plant, it is genotype M or subspecies Australis. And we call it European common reed, but for the rest of the night, I'll probably just call it frag. Um, and here is a native Phragmites. So as I said, this plant exists on all the continents across the, the uh, earth, except Antarctica. So Canada does have a native Phragmites and it's called subspecies Americanus. And it looks quite different than the aggressive invader, as you can see on the screen. This one does not create these dense, tall mats, as you see in this tall, aggressive invader. The native Phragmites has been around for over 3,000 years, documented in, in ecosystems in North America, and, and likes to play quite nice with all the other um, species that we find in our, in our native habitats. This is a close-up of the Phragmites seed head. Um, so one of the most aggressive, uh, well, one of the characteristics that makes this plant so aggressive and, and Canada's worst invasive plant is the ability for it to um, disperse through seeds, uh, stolons, stems, and the rhizomes. So this is the seed head, and this will make about 2,000 viable seeds per year. And there's thousands of seed heads in any of the infestations that we see. The seeds themselves are wind dispersed, so they can blow just about anywhere and, and uh, where if it lands somewhere it, it can grow, and it certainly will. This is a good shot of what's our, what are called stolons, and these are the above ground root systems that Phragmites will use in situations like this to send out new growth across a wetland or above the water um, where the sunlight's not penetrating through. So it's going to send stolons out and then send new shoots up every foot or so. Uh, and this is allowing these dense mats of Phragmites to develop um, into to some of the um, 
pretty intense situations, this will grow, this here um, stolons can grow at 0.76 centimeters a day that they've been documented growing at that speed. So that, that's a pretty impressive growth rate, uh, making it another reason why it's quite an aggressive invader. And each of these stalks that we see can grow at about four centimeters a day. So it, it's a very impressive grower during the growing season. Here's another image of those stolons um, that's St. Joseph Island in Lake Huron. And you know these things are shooting out all over the place. We're just only looking at one. Um, so it's a, this, this part of the growth of the plant can help it achieve up to 200 stems per meter squared. And that's what type of density that these, this Phragmites can develop in, in these uh, habitats. Um, and then the final way that it can reproduce is underground. So what a common theme to, or common way to think of this is what you see above ground is likely happening below ground. These rhizomes can have been documented 10 meters into the ground. And once a Phragmites establishes in a certain location, the rhizomes is the predominant way that it will reproduce. So it's actually growing underground and sending growth stalks up into the, the above ground space, sending stolons out along the above ground area and then dispersing by seeds. So those three ways of reproducing make it a really um, competitive invader. It, it can reproduce at rates much faster than our native Phragmites and native species in these habitats. And of course, once these um, plants are in certain conditions like shorelines, which we all know Phragmites likes to hang out on, it wave energies, ice in the winter breaks these plants up and then redisperses the roots and the stolons to other places. Even the stalks have been seen to reestablish in some spots. And so this is kind of another reason why it's such a difficult thing to um, manage on the landscape because it's moving around in so many different ways. And here's a close up of this piece of root and you can see the um, new growth establishing uh, right from just washed up material. And of course this thing can live in all sorts of environments. Um, I could probably, uh, sorry. This, it has a tolerance for brackish water all the way to fresh water. So that's why it's been able to kind of move in from the northern side of the continent and kind of make its way into freshwater ecosystems. And I'll have more on that in a minute. But it also inhabits uh, dry habitats all the way to water that can get up to one meters in depth. So this, this area, for instance, this image, the water levels are coming up and down and the plant is sending out root systems as the water level rises to kind of survive and stay properly rooted and, and get its nutrients. So even, you know, adjusting water levels doesn't phase this plant. And then of course it can hang out on in really dry areas all the way to really wet areas. And this is a shot on Point Farms Provincial Park. This is a beach, it's a dry temperate ecosystem and all the other sides of shown so, so, so far are, are wetlands. So the ability of this plant to kind of dominate across all these different ecosystem types is another reason why it's such aggressive invader. And here we're looking at um, the crown marsh in Long Point uh, and you can see how dense this infestations become. There's just nothing but Phragmites and a couple of tall trees. Um, this, it can hang out in pH balance of water from 4.8 to 8.2, and it'll just compete for all the nutrients that's in the system. Uh, it's also alleopathic, which means it sends out chemicals from its root systems that break down the structural proteins of all the neighboring plants and gives it this additional competitive edge because then the plants nearby are, are weakened. So they have trouble, they have trouble um, holding their defense up against this um, moving uh, invader. And then finally, in Canada, we have absolutely no natural controls for this um, invasive subspecies. So it's one very aggressive invader. Um, 
And maybe some of us are thinking, how did we let this happen? <laughs> and a lot of people thought that, and they actually did a study to kind of figure out what happened. And what they discovered is when they went back and pulled the herbarium samples, they looked at 1,740 herbarium samples from 21 collections across Canada and entered all that into a database and analyzed it and created these maps to help us understand how this, um, this invader got to become so, so prevalent on the landscape. And what they discovered is they, the first collection was in Nova Scotia in 1910. The second was in the St. Lawrence River near Quebec City in Montreal in the 1920s. And then the first Southwestern Ontario specimen was in 1948. Then by the 1950s, um, that was so, so then by 1950, it was really only in these like localized spots um, based on 22 collections. And at the same time, this native subspecies Americanus had very, had very widespread distribution in Canada. Um, in 1910 was a hundred years before we, we, we actually recognized this thing as a alien invader. So this strongly supports, um, sorry, I'll just move on. So by 1970, it's still, establishing locally um, in it's still found in only southwestern Nova Scotia um, and Ontario and in the St. Lawrence River Valley but just kind of doing some very localized expansion but still kind of flying under the radar because no one is yet realizing that this is different than the native Phragmites um, and then in the next uh, chunk of time up to 1990 uh, the subspecies Australis has become very frequent in the St. Lawrence River Valley in southwestern Ontario, and it has started extending western into eastern Ontario. And by this point, there's enough expansion going on that it's starting to turn some eyes and people are starting to say, you know, what, what's going on here? Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, we, we created or we came up with the subspecies, Austral um, subspecies Australis to distinguish the native to the non-native aggressive invader. Um, but while we were figuring all this out, um, Phragmites was continuing to rapidly expand. And at this point, up to 2010, it's now spread into Western Canada and has appeared in Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario, Southern Manitoba, and all the way to Southern um, BC and a, a few points out to, in that province. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's the story that that's what happened. And, you know, here we are in southwestern Ontario with, uh, you know, aggressive invasive Phragmites all around us. Um, and what is predicted to happen based on the qualities of this plant, the characteristics and the habitats that it is invading. Um, we think that it has the ability to, to uh, become abundant in this entire area of Canada. So this is concerning. Um, and we have to kind of sit back and think what, what really happened? Why, why could the, the rate of expansion is, is um, increasing and you know, what is happening and how is that, are, are we to be in, are we involved in this? And I think, you know, that paper and watching and learning as we go, we, we can attribute this rapid expansion to a lot of the land use changes that happened along in those same periods. So we had population explosions in the 90s and, and a lot of land use changes as a result, uh, urbanization, we had eutrophication of lakes and hydrological changes and all of these disturbances can help Phragmites along. Um, Phragmites likes to establish in disturbed locations and I mean, I, I see this in Essex all the time, and I'm sure a lot of us do, where new residential developments go in, stormwater systems are put in, um, new drainage networks are put in, and it really doesn't take long in our county to see Phragmites establish in these new places. And this is going to be the theme I think we can see repeated as this species moves across the country. Um, we also build roads uh, on, and we've been building a lot of roads since the 70s. And we know that that is a major spread vector for Phragmites. 
uh, road maintenance, even hydro corridor maintenance um, has all contributed to the movement of this, this plant. And then finally, back in 2012, um, I mapped Phragmites from Sarnia to uh, Tobomori along the Lake Huron shore. When it was really just starting to show up on the Lake Huron shoreline, it hadn't really taken a strong foothold yet. And the correlation between finding it on the road and then down the drain and at the shoreline was very strong. And I think that we'll keep seeing road networks lend a hand to the expansion of Phragmites if uh, nothing is done. And this was taken in 2011 in Sault Ste. Marie, um, east of Sault Ste. Marie on, on Highway 17. So evidence of it moving in the, in the road corridors um, into Northern Ontario and West. And just because this was you know, 10 years old now, I took a minute yesterday to look at EdMaps and pulled the more recent mapping. This was just from yesterday. And I, I kind of sat back and said, yeah, okay, this is, this is the pattern. You can see the reports coming in all along the highways and that's not um, coincidence. This is uh, people assisting the movement of this plant. Um, so that was a really quick introduction to Phragmites, uh, why it's uh, Canada's worst aggressive invader. Um, so now I'm just going to go through a few of the reasons why this is quite concerning. Um, and there are many reasons. Uh, a few include costly impacts to the infrastructure that we've built, um, sight lines around roadways. I don't know um, if anyone has ever pulled up to an intersection and, and you know, can't see past a hedge or, or Phragmites. I think that's becoming more common in, in our county. Um, but, you know, that's, it, it's a, a public safety concern. Um, there's also been loss to traditional medicines, significant historical and cultural sites. And I really think that the socioeconomic impacts are, are one of the biggest drivers in Ontario for some of the control programs that have um, sprouted up across the province, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But some of these um, concerns I think we've seen in our area, you know, our recreational natural uh, spaces are inundated with Phragmites and it really does change the experience that you're having when you visit a, a coastal wetland um, and and you know you're or canoeing down say River Canard and on one side and the other is a solid stands of frag. Um, the recreation is there you're still on the river paddling but it's it's a really different experience. Um, viewscapes are gone, lake access is gone, this image on the right here, swim at your own risk, that's a, an actual kids camp on the Lake Huron shore that had lost its shoreline to Phragmites and had adapted by no longer having water sports on the shoreline. They, they put in a pool <laughs> because they couldn't have their shoreline anymore. Um, and then you've got this other image here on the left that is, I guess it'd be your right. Anyway, this is the... Um, an image submitted by the Ontario Ministry of Transportation where, you know, frag is a problem for them too, where they're constantly managing it and keeping it from inundating on the infrastructure that we all pay for. Uh, so, so, you know, major concerns there. Another one that maybe isn't as thought about as much is the encroachment on residential property and the risk of fire. And I think we're gonna see maybe more of this risk as uh, the climate continues to change. And, you know, we have this situation in our county too with um, frag stands standing really close to some of our homes. And I think it's a, a really important risk to, to consider and a concern that we shouldn't overlook. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. I think it opens on another screen, but if you just go to YouTube and put in Frag Mighty's Burnett Golf Course, you can watch this really short one minute video of this raging fire. Um, and I, I can't help but think of the number of golf courses in Essex that have a lot of Frag Mighty's. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, another concern for us locally, but also across the country as this plant, uh, if, if it's left to expand and, and get as bad as could be predicted. 
Um, and then this one is obviously close to all our hearts, um, the significant reduction in biodiversity and the impacts that Phragmites has on wildlife. Um, it's an identified threat to 25 of our 217 species at risk in Ontario. Uh, it's a major impact on wildlife. This image was taken in 2012 by uh, Dr. Janice Gilbert, a wetland ecologist at the time, and well, she still is, but she was working as a wetland ecologist with the Ministry of Natural Resources at the time. And she walked into Rondeau Provincial Park and went kind of around the edges of this stand and, and, and wildlife tends to use the edges of Phragmites. You know, you, you'll see some frag use or some wildlife using the edges of these stands, but the further you get into these deep, dense, dark monoculture Phragmites, it's a dead zone. There's nothing in there but Phragmites. And that's hugely concerning. Um, to, to the loss of, or to our, to our need to protect biodiversity um, and its threat to, to its um, sustainability. And here we have the, the other wetland ecosystem changes as a result of Phragmites. Um, hydrological alterations. Um, Phragmites is a big problem in drainage systems. It, it actually can slow the flow of water and, and that can be really concerning in um, a place like Essex when if we keep getting these flash flood events and, and the thunderstorm we had today was was incredible <laughs> amounts of water dropped in just a few minutes and you know if, if Phragmites is, is left unchecked in our drain systems it can really cause backups and flooding. Uh, nutrient cycle changes in wetlands, uh, decomposition rates, so Frag is a much slower to decompose than our native systems or native species and that can you know, really change the look and the uh, bog up the wetland over time as these um, stalks die off and fall over and, and really start to bog up the wetland and the decomposition is so much slower. And then of course the plant of biodiversity is lost as well. Um, and then I, I the, the last kind of concern I'd like to touch on is, is we have these um, predictions, climate change predictions. If, if you've seen um, Erka's presentation and predictions on climate change for Windsor Essex, you know that what's predicted is these warmer, wetter, wilder um, climate. Um, and wetlands in particular are quite vulnerable to the coming changes because they, they need to be able to migrate with the changing water levels. So, if we have high water in our lakes or in our coastal areas, um, in our river systems, our native species want to migrate back into what are called refuge areas. And they'll hang out there and you know, year after year be in those places. And as the water levels recede, they are set to kind of move, the, the seed banks there and they're ready to kind of move and, and um, migrate toward the new water level. Uh, and this is a cycle that's been happening for 10,000 years. <laughs> um, and now we have a wall of Phragmites hanging out in our wet meadows and emergent marshes and, and really disrupting this natural process that has evolved over time. Um, and you know, we're, we're really in a really dire situation for maintaining healthy wetlands and even maintaining the ability for the wetlands to adapt to a changing climate, it's already a distressed system with Phragmites in it. So I think it's a really, um, really big concern. Um, so that that's a, a lot of different uh, concerns that I've outlined. And I mean, I I don't. I think that we could all probably pause and say, "Wow, this is a, a really big problem." And I, I can assure you that we're not the only ones thinking that. Um, in 2011, the Ontario Phragmites Working Group was uh, created because of this, you know, number of organizations across the province having similar concerns to this aggressive invader coming in. Um, it was in 2011, uh, Dr. Gilbert, Nancy Vidler, and myself were sitting in Port Franks, Ontario, thinking to ourselves, you know, what are we going to do? Because we have this major problem showing up on the lake here on shore and we have this chance to get ahead of it. 
um, but we don't have the right tools in our tool bucket to properly control it. And I'm going to talk about control methods in a minute, but at the time we, we thought it would be a good idea to start getting some of the professionals together and having conversations about what could be done to get action on, on the getting the right control um, tools in the province. Uh, the first meeting was, I think, 11 or 12 people. And it, it's now grown to become, I, I believe, the largest conference, annual conference in Ontario that focuses solely on Phragmites and the lessons that all of these organizations across the province have been learning over the years. Um, in 2013, it actually became a committee of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, which um, was pretty helpful uh, to kind of speed along its growth. So really um, control options in Ontario uh, with the help of the OPWG members has evolved significantly in the last 20 years. Um, the OIPC like evolved so rapidly in the last 10 years really that they updated the 2012 BMPs to reflect that growth in, in lessons and, and the things that we've learned. So now we have um, brand new BMPs in Ontario published in 2020 that are available for anyone looking to kind of look closer at some of these control options I'm going to discuss. Um, but really we have three different categories at our disposal right now in Ontario and in Canada, biological control, chemical and manual or what we call non-chemical control. The biological control method has been in development for 20 years. Um, they initially looked for, or they initially found 175 species of European natural enemies. Um, Cause that's, I guess, where Phragmites came from, which maybe I didn't talk about yet. Um, so maybe I should say that this particular genotype, the subspecies Australis is from the continent Europe. <laughs> so that's where it naturally occurs. And so they went there to find if there was any natural enemies and they did find 177, 75 species. Um, but there's complicated processes in bringing them over to new ecosystems. So the, through their process and, and eliminations and all of their studies, they, they narrowed it down to two stem boring noctuid moths on the screen, the Arachnera neurica and the Arachnera gemini puncta. Um, and it's the larvae in them that actually um, prey on invasive Phragmites. Um, and it, it's moving through the process. They are currently working through a research stage, including uh, field sites in Southern Ontario. Um, from what I understand, they're right now comparing or trying to find good field sites that have native Phragmites and non-native Phragmites in the same vicinity so they can get a good sense of what happens when we release these things um, if it, if it, if we're also going to be sacrificing our native Phragmites. Um, so really the objective with this biological control method is that it'll help. Um, I think the goal is to bring it down to infestations much closer to the native genotype, and, but it won't actually get rid of the plant. So if we think kind of similar to the purple loosestrife story where uh, if, if this thing can, if these moths can be released, and they actually reproduce here, they may actually be a way to kind of reduce the density of the stands, but it certainly won't get rid of them entirely. Um, chemical control is the next tool that we use uh, in Ontario. Um, there's a caveat with it though, because in Canada, we don't have access to water safe ch um, chemicals that they use in the US. Um, and in the, in the US, they're using the Rodeo, Aquanid, Aquapro, ShoreClear, and Habitat, um, active ingredients, glyphosate, or amazapir. And, and they are allowed to apply these things over water. And they are also allowed to do that from a helicopter, which can be incredibly helpful when you're dealing with, you know, hectares of solid Phragmites. To have the ability to treat it from the air is essential. So... They are, uh, have been doing this in the States for, for years. 
in Canada, our legal options for chemical control to treat phragmites is um, a little bit limited. Uh, we have these two or three products, Brother Max and Vision Max, and then Arsenal Powerline. So we have the same active ingredients. They're different products. Um, the products registered in Canada are not approved for overwater use. Um, and it's, it's the surfactant in these chemicals that have been proven um, harmful to amphibians. So they are just not allowed to be used over water here. So if, if um, a land manager is using a chemical control on Phragmites, it's, it's on what are called dry sites. So if you remember me describing Phrag living in wet to dry environments, this is a tool that you can use on in a dry situation where there's no water nearby. Um, in, in the water, there has been very limited uh, control options in Ontario uh, until rather recently, which is coming up next. But the um, Ontario cosmetic pesticide ban uh, prohibits the use of these, these um, chemicals even without this letter of opinion. So they, they created this ban to protect the residents of Ontario from pesticides and herbicides uh, being used, you know, however they people wanted to. So they kind of put some restrictions in place to protect us. And then they put in um, exemptions to uh, allow for use in certain situations. And one of them was a natural resource exemption. So we have this uh, opportunity to apply to get a permission to apply these chemicals in dry environments to treat Phragmites in Ontario. So it's a rather limited process and it's it's a bit of a um, app, you gotta go through the permitting process, but it's not an impossible uh, tool. It's just one you have to work a little harder to get access to. Uh, you also need a license um, to uh, up, even apply to get the, the letter of opinion. Um, you have to have a what's called a pesticide license and you just write an exam and you get that license and then you're, you're able to use that tool. Um, but, you know, while that has become a kind of a, a challenge, something that the Ontario Frag Working Group's been um, highlighting for years with the province, um, talking to uh, representatives about the difficulties treating Phragmites and the, the real need to get access to those water safe chemicals in Ontario. Um, and in 2016, a partnership between the MNRF and the Long Point Phragmites Action Alliance started that momentum down the road of um, potentially bringing this chemical, or uh, at least glyphosate, um, Roundup Custom, into Ontario. And they did this by applying for what's called an emergency use registration. And that's apply or given to um, the OMNRF is the applicant, and this is an application to Health Canada, uh, the PMRA, and the uh, Ministry of Environment needs to approve this application. The OMNRF is then approved to trial the use of this chemical in Ontario. And with this program came rigorous studies by the University of Waterloo and um, years of efficacy and what they've been able to do is, is um, prove that this is something that works in Ontario and the data is showing that it, it is safe and, it, and, it's, and it's working. And they, for the first time in Ontario, they were able to apply herbicides from a helicopter. Um, but the, the piece that I think we've learned in Ontario is, is applying the chemical is not is not all you can do. Once you have this huge standing dead biomass, you have to then remove that. And that's done with fire or by just simply cutting it down. Uh, it is an important piece of a good control program. And so that is certainly being, uh, is certainly happening in, in Long Point and Rondeau. And if, if you do get a chance to go down there, um, you'll be surprised or, or maybe pleased by the results of this emergency use registration program. Um, the native species are, are there, they're coming back and, and the Phragmites is, is slowly bring, being brought under control. And you're talking like thousands of hectares of Phragmites. So it's a really um, successful program in Ontario. And, and it's leading, hopefully we're all kind of waiting 
patiently for it to lead to the registration of these water safe chemicals uh, in Ontario. Um, and here is the Long Point uh, marshes. And, and here's the, the uh, one of the tools, a marsh master that's used to kind of bring down Phragmites after it's been sprayed with the aerial uh, herbicide. Um, and then I just wanted to use these two as, as before and after because it, it's astounding, you know, like we can do this. We can bring down Phragmites in Ontario. It, it, it's, it's, it's happening, it's occurring in other communities. And, and this is a, a nice image to show you know, these healthy wetlands can be restored. So while that emergency use um, registration program has been proceeding for four or five years now, um, the rest of Ontario wasn't able to have access to that water safe chemical just yet. So, you know, but nobody wants to sit around and, and, and wait. There's been a lot of communities that have taken it upon themselves to fight back. Um, and one of and, and from that in from that need to, you know, bring the the species down. There's been some really um, innovative techniques developed right here in Ontario. So you know, the lack of a chemical has actually kind of led to some pretty uh, innovative stuff to to control this thing without a chemical. Um, and some of these techniques are now being used in in the U.S. where you know, years ago, we were all looking at them going, gee, we wish we could have that non or that chemical you have. <laughs> and now they're going, oh, wow, this cut to drown method or is really working. And, and that's what we're seeing on the screen here. Um, where it's called a cut to drown. Uh, and there's three different ways that this is being used and spading, cane cutting and still cutting are, are the different options, different hand tools that are being used um, in Ontario. And I'll just run through those really quick. The spading method was um, created by Lynn Short. Uh, she's a professor, a horticulture professor at Humber College in Georgian Bay and, and lives at Wimblewood Beach in Georgian Bay and, and uh, family cottage been around for centuries or year, I don't know, centuries, but years. Um, I think it was her parents that gave her the cottage and she had Fred come in and completely take over her wet beach shoreline and not pleased with that started experimenting thinking if she could dig it out or stop the photosynthesis of the plant perhaps it would stress out the root system and cause it to stop growing so she experimented with that for a few years and, and found it was working to reduce the density and eventually just stopped growing in front of her cottage because every year she just went in and spaded it and really it's a fairly um, kind of specialized technique where you're taking a flat edge spade and, and sticking it at this angle to kind of sever the root system. And then you're pulling the stalk out and bagging it and, and getting rid of the stalk. Um, since that was created, I know a group of, um, the, I think it was some of the, the Bruce Peninsula environmental group started trying to spade up on the Bruce in some different habitat types that weren't sandy, didn't work as well for them. So um, I, think, I think the lessons we've learned about spading is, is it's a useful technique when the densities are manageable by a community group and it's a good sandy shoreline to, to kind of make that spading motion easy enough for a volunteer or an employee. Uh, and then, they were also trying it for a while in these wetter communities and, and finding it not to be as effective either. And Janice, um, Dr. Janice Gilbert came up with this um, raspberry cane cutting method. And this is similar to spading, but it's using a cane cutter, which is a close up image in this picture with a sharp kind of hook to it. And you stick that hook down as close as you can to the substrate and you're kind of hooking the stalk instead of spading it and then leaving it to drown because there's a good half a meter to meter water depth above the, the stalk now and it can't uh, regrow. There is some regrowth that happens but it repeat spading every year is working um, particularly in um, the South Bruce Peninsula the Oliphant Fishing Islands Phragmites Community Group has been employing this method 
and seeing really great success in some of the coastal wetlands. And then this final tool, the still hedge trimmer. Um, and this one isn't obviously made for wet areas, but it's certainly working to bring down some monster stands of Phragmites around the province. Uh, and it's just a matter of, you know, managing the spread. So you're bringing down the plant um, as close under the water. So again, you're putting this tool into the water and cutting underwater. And then you have to collect all of the, the fallen stems as you would if you were cane cutting or spading, bag it, bag it and get rid of it. So it's a labor intensive method, but it is drowning the plant and, and, and working. Um, here's a shot of that wetland before and then after after the, the still cutting um, a year later, the growth is just not returning. The water levels are too deep. The plant essentially drowns. Um, now those are manual intensive methods. Uh, community groups are, are latching onto them and feeling empowered. Something They have something they can do to fight back against this, this invader. But some of the stands in Ontario are just too enormous and Something that uh, came out of the Invasive Phragmites Control Center um, is this machine called a Truxor. And this came over, I think, she, I think she sourced it in Europe. And what it does is drops this mechanical claw into the water and cuts under the water, much like the cane cutter, but it's mechanized now. And it can uh, move through wetlands at a speed that a group of volunteers just couldn't touch. Um, and these are the machines that are being used in Oliphant now that are, are making a, a really huge difference to bringing Phragmites under control in those wetlands. Here's one image of this uh, machine in action. Um, and it, I, I think, uh, as you can see, as, as the stand is coming down, all of these stalks and the seeds and the rhizomes are, are kind of, they're stolen, sorry, are, are there, they're present. And part of this method really is cleaning that up. So it's, fairly um, time consuming, but it is working. Um, we have to be careful with timing with these methods, um, any of them, you know, you want to be careful you're not disturb disturbing anything that does live in these wetlands. Um, fish spawning, birds uh, and turtles are still present in some of the edges of these stands. Um, so it's important that, you know, you have somebody watching for wildlife as these machines are moving through or um, you know, you're moving slow enough with the spade or the, the still cutter that you're, you're not gonna accidentally hurt something. Um, and you know, some experience uh, crew and if, you, if having somebody come and show a, or do a training session can always be really beneficial. Um, and then obviously site logistics is a big issue with this method. And again, some really ingenuitive stuff has come or innovative stuff has come out of the, the challenge here because, you know, you finally find a method that is going to work and is going to be scalable, but then how do you get rid of biomass at that scale? And in Oliphant, they came up with these floating barges. Um, and so what these do is, is follow the trucks or around and the truck store has that conveyor belt and it drops the frag on these barges. And then the barges are being brought to the shore. And then the, these nets are being lifted and brought to a bin that the municipality is actually donating and helping the community group um, by collecting the frag on the shore. And then the bin is dumped at the, the local landfill. Um, and this method just runs. It's like a conveyor belt of Phragmites. And if you're ever up in the Oliphant Fishing Islands area, this is happening right now and it's quite a scene to see and um, they're, they're, they are getting ahead of it and it's a pretty impressive control program. Um, so that's, uh, and uh, sorry, there are many other places in Ontario where this is starting to pick up. Um, more and more communities are saying, you know, they're sick of waiting for this water safe chemical that, that should be coming, but is, is, is slow and, and rightly so. I mean, obviously we have to take precautions and make sure it's gonna be safe for our province, but there are a lot of people who have been moving ahead with these control to drown methods anyway. Um, 
And I'll just take a few minutes now to kind of walk through some of them. Um, and I thought this was a cute snake because, you know, the the point of fry control is to really do the most good with with the least the least amount of harm. And this cut to drown method is is really proving to to many communities that you know we don't necessarily need to use chemical to kill all the frag. We can use it in certain situations, but this cut to drown method is a rather complementary, um, safe uh, method that can be mixed in to any control program. So the first story that I'll show you really quick is um, near to us. Uh, you know, you could get up there in a couple of hours to go see some of the work they're doing. Uh, Lambton Shores, uh, the municipality of Lambton Shores, and the uh, Lambton Shores Fragmites Community Group. Uh, this is Nancy Fiddler in the middle, and I mentioned her earlier in the presentation. Um, Janice Gilbert's wearing the Great Lakes sweater, and these two um, and myself were the, you know, three sitting around going, what do we do, and, and started the uh, Ontario Frag Working Group. So Nancy's been around for years and she lives in Port Franks and she saw Frag Mighties coming in and taking over and knew that there were some things she, she couldn't just sit back and watch this invader take off. So, you know, they started this group and they have been working very diligently to bring Frag Mighties under control. Um, they actually created the first watershed approach in Ontario uh, by mapping Frag Mighties across the whole municipality. Um, or in early days, they got a grant, I think it was a Canada Summer Jobs grant, and hired a GIS tech at the municipal offices, and they went out and, and did the mapping. And this is the result. Uh, it was extensive across the entire township, along the whole shoreline. Um, very dense mats in uh, the Wood Drive area, um, south of Kettle Point here, um, and down into, you know, what's called West Bosanquet Township. So just like intensely dense cells of Phragmites, much like what we see in Big Creek and Cedar Creek and Hillman Marsh here in Essex. And what they did is divided the township up just using the wards that had already been created and then started to uh, break the shoreline down even further into blocks so, and, and management areas. So they created, um, I think there was seven different management areas along the shoreline. And this is the West Bosanquet Township. So that's from the edges of the First Nation um, properties and down to the edge of the municipality. And, you know, then they broke these up into blocks and each block has its own management regime or um, prescription, I guess. Uh, so it say in the green here is, is solid frag and, and requires truck sores to get in there to cut down the Phragmites. And the yellow were places where it wasn't as dense and community groups could come in and help with some of the other methods. So using this, you know, mapping approach, we now, they now had a plan, a strategy of implementation and they, they started to go go ahead with it. Um, and this is just a close up of block ones to four because here's block four. And this is that Lampton Center. And this is that um, day camp I mentioned earlier where the shoreline was completely covered in Phragmites. So the Phragmites working group, or sorry, the Lampton Shores Phragmites, there's so many of them. That community group wanted to focus on this uh, shoreline because they really wanted to help this camp, um, ch children's camp, get their access to the shoreline back. Um, and here's that image again. This is what it looked like in 2012. Um, and so with the help of the community group and getting uh, funding from the municipality, the province and, and other sources, um, they were fundraising locally as well. They brought in, uh, they brought in the uh, army, I guess, and they brought, they started cutting down I'm saying army like it's a joke, I guess. I shouldn't say that, but the rivalry, the, the machines and um, the invasive Phragmites control center uh, and the truck source. And this is the shoreline in 2017. So that's that's the transformation, you know, August 13th, 2017 to September. This is one cut and that they got their shoreline. They could finally see through. They hadn't been able to see through in years. Um, and then the work continued and the following year they brought in volunteers to cut the um, return growth 
and they started moving down the shoreline with the truck oars. And you can see them coming in um, here. And in the background, you can see this solid wall of Phragmites and that continues all the way up to Kettle Point. So they're, they're working their way along the shoreline. Um, and then I was there just earlier this year, kind of doing some follow-up mapping for the invasive frag control center and found just an astounding view of that exact shoreline that I had seen back in 2012. Um, and, and they are, the shoreline's back and, and it's, it's such an amazing thing to see a community group achieve in such a short um, time. Um, they're moving on through the other blocks. There's still work to be done. There's still follow-up control. I mean, on this beach alone, I saw a few stocks coming in, but what the camp has now done is they have their staff that they hire every year to maintain the grounds trained on what Phragmites growth looks like. And they go down there once a week or as needed, and they just spade it out. Um, so it's a, it's a regular maintenance program now but that's much better than the solid stand of frag that they once had. And there's another view of the shoreline looking the other way. So a very good success program. And this is block one and two of that same shoreline. Again, a solid stand of frag. And, and there's one individual kind of slowly bringing it down with the hedge trimmers. And um, here's the same area in 2021. Uh, so this cut to drown method is proving fairly um, effective in, in Lambton Shores. Um, and then we have the municipality of King Carden. Um, here is Bruce Dale Conservation Area. And this was a partnership between the CA up there, the Lake Huron Center for Coastal Conservation, Enbridge and the municipality of King Carden both uh, contributed funds to uh, bring in the invasive frag control center to implement this project. Um, and there's the shoreline years later, uh, 2015, 2018. This one took a few more years than the other, but it, it got there. And this is a campground. So the people who um, rent trail, they, they rent their, their spaces for their trailers at this park now have a beach again. Uh, they haven't had a beach in years. Um, and again, a similar system is set up in King Garden now where they have community groups um, walking the shoreline to maintain what's been done so that th these, these stands don't return again. Um, these people are trained to identify the regrowth and spade it out, cane cut it out, using those hand tools that they have at their disposal. Um, so, and I think some of the themes that they um, have, we've learned over the years with frag control is, is you know, we really want to if, if we wanted to get something like this started, it's really important to think about what, what the goals of your control program are and then choose what appropriate methods that you have. Um, it's always going to be a combination of methods. Some, some spots on the shoreline may be sprayable and, and that, that's really still the, the, the best way to bring down Phragmites in one year um, is to spray it. Um, then you know your regrowth is much lower than than the other methods, but it doesn't work in all cases. So you have to be willing to have you know different methods used um, across your management areas, um, and then really thinking through the timing to undertake these activities. Um, the cutting to drown method, um, nothing starts until the middle of July because of the sensitivities of species, and then it can go until all the way to December. Um, while spraying with a chemical, you really have a window, a shorter window um, in September, because that's when the plant's kind of going to sleep for the winter and you want to hit it with that chemical at that point. So it pulls the chemicals into the roots, but that's a really short window to, to use that method. So there's a little bit of planning involved in how to go about doing the best, the most good with the least amount of harm. Um, the other lessons that we've learned over the years is a lot of these management um, success stories are locally driven. Uh, it, it usually does take a community group um, uh, of concerned citizens coming together to really lead the charge. Um, and then the, the, with the assistance of management plans, these community groups have been able to make very big strides um, in getting momentum going, uh, finding funding, 
uh, if you can show a funder that you have a good solid plan of attack and, and you have a good um, idea of what you're doing, you're much more likely to get the funding. So, so these management plans are becoming um, really important uh, to get things going. And another um, key piece of FRAG plans that we've been seeing developed is the, the strength of the partnership of, of the local municipality and the conservation authorities. So having those partners at the table are incredibly, it, it's an invaluable to the success stories of these, um, these places, like having the municipality support the, these programs um, with funding, but also with materials and like that bin up in Oliphant, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be money, but it can be, it, it's, if they can provide anything to assist, uh, there's been a lot of um, growth in these programs. And then that long-term piece with uh, follow-up has been incredibly important. Uh, there are some places in Ontario where FRAG was successfully controlled and then quickly returns, right? If there's nobody in place to kind of maintain that control. Um, and then the next piece that's gonna be big in Ontario is this private land control piece. Um, it's always been a struggle in um, in Ontario, you know, like Fragmites on private land, who 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 should be, you know, covering the cost of controlling Frag um, across the province when it's kind of everywhere. Um, and it, and there was there's some work done in this space um, with a I'm sorry I need a drink of water. Um, Uh, when I was working with um, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, they were exploring how to kind of manage Phragmites on a landscape level in Norfolk County to complement some of the work done in the um, Long Point marshes. So it was kind of understood that we needed to move into the watershed. And um, so working with the Big Creek subcommittee of the Long Point Phragmites Action Alliance, I authored this control implementation plan and it really operationalized implementation across property boundaries using um, GIS and landowner engagement and kind of allowed for the one of uh, just a very quick process of um, identifying landowners who were impacted by Phragmites and then getting permission and then hiring a contractor to go in and, and eradicate it. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's a challenging space because if you're gonna offer control services, who's gonna do the follow-up? Is it the landowner? Um, is, it, is it always the, an organization or is a community approach like what's going on in some of the Lake Huron shores that I've shown you a more sustainable way to go forward where you have people on the ground trained and, and ready to, um, to control the regrowth? It's, I think this is all going to start um, emerging as Ontario moves ahead with some of this larger scope planning. And this is, um, this is the Ontario Fights Back portion of the presentation where there's been some really good momentum in the last year or two on the Fragmites front with what's called this Green Shovels Collaborative. And what they've done is, is recognized that we have great momentum in Ontario. There's huge success stories going on across the province, but there's this missing larger level scope or plan or strategy for the province. So we're having these, we're putting fires out in different places around the province, but nobody is taking a, how do we do this effectively from a provincial perspective, from a Southwestern Ontario perspective, from a Northwestern Ontario perspective. There's, there really needs to be momentum at that level. And so with that understood, um, and then this private land piece where, you know, how do you fit that in? Um, so with uh, this has been work happening in the last year. Uh, the first section is this um, strategy to coordinate management of FRAG in Ontario. Um, and then the third chapter has a piece um, that's been Kind of breaking the barriers caused by traditional funding models, which has been a bit of a challenge for some of the community groups working on this, to um, find 
sustainable funding and funding for things that are traditionally hard to fund like equipment or um, training and, and those types of things. So this chapter three or this third component of this Green Shovels Initiative made micro grants available to some of these com community groups and it looks like that's going to um, continue. Uh, and then the second chapter was, I think a big missing piece as well, looking at the cost benefit analysis to really kind of determine the importance of controlling Phragmites in Ontario. Um, so just a bit more on this strategy that started with this survey of practitioners and they found um, the top priorities um, for the practitioners across the province were saying, you know, we needed this access to water safe herbicide and we need multi-year funding. Um, and they also stress the importance of new tools, municipal participation, public education and an increase in qualified contractors. And then this common theme in all cases was that the benefit I guess I've mentioned this already, but I guess I'll hammer it home that the local municipality and conservation authorities are really important in these strategies. Um, and then this second piece, um, the cost benefit analysis. So this was done by the Invasive Species Center and they looked at the cost of, the projected cost of Phragmites if we, if we do nothing, and then the benefit of treating Phragmites um, and found that the cost of controlling frag in Ontario right now is estimated at 90 to $109 million. Um, but the annu annual benefits exceed that at 113 with a one-time benefit of $357 million. So the what this is telling us is the cost benefit ratios um, it makes sense. It makes ex some economic sense for us to invest in controlling Phragmites in Ontario. And it makes economic sense in year one, and that economic sense grows um, as you move into the 10th year of control. So, I mean, hmm. what um, I guess I'm trying to say tonight is that there's a huge momentum in Ontario, and what it's a, we, we can't necessarily sit back and let this happen in Ontario or spread across the, the, the country. I mean, this, this species has the potential to do that. And here in Ontario, we've been fighting back for years and we've learned a lot of lessons. And I think we're, we're finally getting to the point where we're saying we know how to do this now. Now we need to scale up to, a, to the level that it, we're actually going to be able to get this infestation under control. And I do think that we can win this fight. And I think most of the people involved in frag control in, in Ontario believe the same thing. And now we just have to kind of keep momentum going and, and keep moving on that provincial strategy and, and kind of start finding uh, more unique ways to finance the control of this, this species. So I guess I'll end by saying um, as, as the president of the field naturalist, sometimes I think perhaps this is time for something to happen in Essex County. Um, I'm seeing success in other places. And I think, you know, what, what is stopping um, a community group in Essex County from, from starting the fight here? So I just kind of pose that as, as a, maybe a, a dream of mine to see some momentum uh, started in Essex County. It's, it's working in Ontario. Uh, there's no reason it couldn't work here. And I will stop. I've been speaking for a while. <laughs> and a special thank you to, to Janice Gilbert um, for nearly all the photos in this presentation. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. That's, that's great, Karen. Thank you very much. Very informative, informative. Actually, some more positive outcomes that are, you know, that are happening across Ontario. That was a good surprise to me. So happy to see yeah. that. Um, so we'll, we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, we've got a few queued up here in the chat, which we can start with. Um, I don't know if you can see them, Karen, or I can read them off. I'm just uh, trying to stop. Okay, stop sharing. There we go. And I think I can see them now. Um, oh, okay. The first question is probably referring to a picture that I'm no longer on. So I'm sorry, John. 
Um, do we still, do you want me to go back to a photo or? Yeah, I'm um, okay. I'll just, I think, move on to the next question because Spring Garden, yes, there is momentum in Spring Garden. And actually, I probably zoomed through my last slide a little too fast because I had a list of things that is going on in Essex County that I didn't have too many photos on. So I could really just mention them. Um, the city of Windsor is right now putting together a Frag Mighty's management plan. The um, a really good example of Frag Mighty's free habitat, and, and that's because it's managed every year, is the Herb Gray Parkway lands that DBI manages as um, the offset to the Herb Gray Parkway system. Um, all those lands that were restored um, are frag free, and, and that's because there's land stewards managing frag annually. Um, there's IRCA does management of, of Frag Mighty's when they can find some funding. They've done work in Hillman Marsh. And I think they have a project in River Canard this year or last year. I've also heard of um, a group called Friends of Cedar Creek working on Fragmites and um, the drainage superintendents in our county uh, are constantly fighting frag and some of them have more resources than others but it is something that they do work on uh, especially Essex, Kingsville, and Amherstburg. So I do think you know there's momentum here too I just didn't talk about it much with pretty photos. <laughs> All right, there's a few more here. Uh, are there, do you know of any plans for Petit Coat? No, I haven't heard of any momentum there. Um, you know what I have heard of though are some of the marinas along the Detroit River um, cut it and just pile it. So I think they're probably getting pretty frustrated too um, and doing the best they can to to do something, but from what I heard, it, it's more of a mowing activity than it is any control. John just says there's been a Frag Mighty's truck parked by his house along the railway track in, in the city of Windsor. Yeah, that makes sense. And, <laughs> yeah. and then uh, I think you've touched on this, but what presently is Urca's role? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned okay. Um, well, I mean, ARCA is clearly aware of the Frag Mighty's problem. Um, I guess I haven't really discussed their role with anyone there in a while. So I, I guess I, I, I guess we'd have to reach out to ARCA to find out if they have anything more current. But I think they have been fighting this fight as long as it's been here. It's, it's um, such an aggressive invader, you know, they, it's everywhere. So it, it, I think what their role could be is to help bring a collaborative together. Like they, they, they can't do it alone either. They're a landowner, so they own land that's inundated with frag. But just like any other landowner, frag is in the adjacent lands. So it, it does take this collaborative community approach to start addressing frag from a landscape level perspective. Um, and they could come to that collaborative and, and be a part of it for sure. Um, yeah. All right. It looks like there's just one more question in the chat and then we'll go to if anybody wants to unmute. Are there some easy ways you can tell the difference between native and invasive species? Um, yeah, uh, um, I guess if there's two pieces to this, the non-native frag is much, it won't establish to the densities that the aggressive invader will, but the sneaky bit is that the aggressive, the um, invading or invasive frag can look a lot like the native frag um, for a couple of years, even as it's establishing its root network. Um, and then it, once it's kind of got its feet down, it just goes. So a lot of the times you can think, oh, that's just the native frag and let it be. And then a couple of years later, you're kind of regretting that decision. But the real easy way or the quick way is the, um, the leaf, the leaf sheath. Um, there's a trick to it. If you, um, there, it's a thick. The native one, I believe, is a very thin. I want to look this up. Actually, sorry, I don't want to misguide anybody. I should have had that ready, but I think it's the thin band, and then the invasive one is a very thick, thick band. Okay. 
in uh, if anybody else has any questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask away or add it to the chat. Mm, can't find the picture. I will. I can um, probably find a good image. Of what I'm talking about. So it's the leaf sheath. Wonder if I can find. Hmm. Anyway, we could go to discussion while I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. We can always add a picture later as well to the website and to the Field Nets uh, Facebook page. Okay. Show some differences. We could that'd be a good good follow up. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a good idea. Thanks, Corey. Then I can focus on this. Are there any, any other questions? Carl, I see yeah, I, yeah, Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is that a yes? Mm -hmm. uh, you started to talk about the potential or some of the things that uh, are already happening in Essex County. Um, I, for one, didn't know of any of this stuff. Uh, how do we, as club become more aware of this and I noticed there's only 13 people that showed up for this presentation today I was a bit surprised I thought there would be more interest because we've talked about having a speaker I think probably Janice Gilbert down to uh, talk about and here we've got a president now that knows all the inside and out and so forth of, of the issues but I, I, I think like any other place um, I think there would be a lot of volunteers, uh, volunteers willing to uh, start becoming more familiar with things and actually getting involved uh, on the ground uh, in learning techniques and so forth that at least would be manual. And then, of course, there's the whole idea of funding. There might be places and so forth that we could actually apply to and, and start doing that, maybe regularly do that. Uh, the foundation that's active in uh, the Windsor and Essex County area is, is one of these places. And I'm sure that on a regular basis, they're looking for green oriented types of projects to throw some money at. So uh, clearly there's, there's potential down here. We've got lots of shoreline. And I think as you already mentioned, shoreline is you know, one of those areas that you know, people are attracted to in order to improve as opposed to the ditches on the roadsides and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, how, how do places get going in this regard? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I read someplace that you've actually uh, made some presentations locally to some of the politicians, is that correct? Um, Janice probably has, oh. and I, I don't know, it wasn't me, but there could have been somebody doing some Frag presentations locally from the Invasive Frag Control Center, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree with you, Carl. I think this is an opportunity for the club for sure. And I think it's a nice fit for the Field Naturalist Club because, you know, it is a such a huge threat to biodiversity and wildlife. It it and we have a, a strong um or in, interest in, I think we could find some volunteers as well. Um, it's just a matter of organizing together and, and deciding the scope we want to take right and and is it is it a you know we'd have to kind of think through how we set something like that up um in other places you know it was it, there's so many different ways that this has happened but i think the the learning is that the the more partners you can get together at the start the the more powerful you can be going forward right so when i say that i mean like there's like action alliances or collaboratives and bringing the partners together but as a community group I suppose we could maybe start by a, you know controlling it in small locations and, and just bringing some of these tools into the county and showing what they can do right yeah so um uh, I have a question on uh, like River Canard area. There's so much 
you know, you can't even see the landscape or like everything else because of it. And there's people along Snake Lane that have taken down their Phragmitis, but then there's piles of Phragmitis along the, the shoreline. Are those just going to grab on and take hold again because they haven't removed them and burnt them or do whatever they need to do? Like these big piles. You mean like dead piles? Yeah, dead piles that they've cleared, but then there is still piles, like a big heaps. And that's what yeah. I wondered. Is that, is that what they did in uh, the Spring Garden Ansi? It looks like big heaps and then there's all the geese and everything are lying on top of it and everything like that just big heaps of uh, phragmitis that are lying in the middle of the the pond yeah that's what they do and that's the challenge with the biomass removal so if you can't get it off site it is practice to just leave it in big piles and the piles will decompose and and dry out and die over the over the years what oh. happens is they are monitored um so if, if it is the, I, well, I know in both cases, it's the IPCC doing that work, the Invasive Fry Control Center. And what they're doing is piling it and letting it die and decompose. And they're coming back year after year to monitor that pile. And if it's, they see or suspect any regrowth coming from it, then they'll either spray it or they'll pull it and like try to dry it out in another spot. Um, so that's practice because the biomass itself is the problem, right? Once you cut it down to drown it, you're opening your wetland back up, but you've got this big pile of biomass to put somewhere. Um, so what they've discovered is it does work to just kind of leave it in a in a pile safe from the elements. So that's going to work for the people that if the I don't know whether it's individual landowners have taken down the pragmatists along Snake Lane, but will that work for them too? The same thing where they've piled it up and hopefully it would just... It should, yeah. And in other cases, like um, on the Lake Huron shore, if you're dealing with say a small property and you've got a small stand of frag and, and you wanna bring that down manually, some people pile it and burn it, like if it's safe to do so, right? You get a, a, a if you have a permit to burn wood in your backyard, putting it in a fire pit is is fair game. <laughs> um, it's just not something you can scale up to the amount of frag that is in River Canard. So yeah. they um, would cut that down with the truck source and then pile it up and leave it to to die that way. Mm -hmm. And yeah, River Canard is is a Phragmites mess. Like you're driving along Front Road and it's shocking <laughs> sometimes to see well, the I, extent of it. Yeah, I'm a kayaker and I can't see any of the landscape anymore. You can't mm -hmm. see where you're at. You just see Phragmites everywhere. Yeah, and, and it doesn't, I don't think have to be that way. And I think the region is probably one of the hardest hit at this point um, for Frag in Southwest Ontario. But I think Long Point rivaled it. Like if anybody had gone up there in the you know, extent before some of the work started to bring that extensive infestation down, I mean, they had several thousand, I think they've hit, they hit 1100 hectares of frag treated last year. So, I mean, it, it, it's happening. It's just a matter of um, time, I think, until the, the right resources can be found to, to do that at that scale here, because <laughs> that's what's needed here. <laughs> um, finding the resources is the challenge, right? But it, I mean, these small success stories like the Snake Lane one, um, Spring Garden is amazing. I don't know if anyone has been in there, but the wetland is back. Um, you can see the water. Uh, and I think that that success story right there created some momentum at the city. Um, you know, it was a confidence builder for, for them to say, hey, there is something we can do. And, and here's, a, here's a tool that's pretty new that could actually work in other places in, in the city. So I think we're gonna see more of that by the city of Windsor in the coming years. Um, and, and I think as that, those tiny success stories start happening in our county, it, maybe, maybe it'll take off and, and we have been in a perhaps good position as a club to facilitate some of that growth. I don't know. Well, we had three weeks of really cold weather in the winter time and there all, so many people were all skating on that pond. It was amazing. It was mm -hmm. so nice to see. Yeah, I was one of those people. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> I'm there and I thought I'm gonna go skating because I actually That's great yeah <laughs> and like um, the river canal too but I mean it's not like river canal is wide enough it's just that the pond there was no water anymore before you know the winter before they did that yeah yeah so I do yeah I agree I think uh anyway those piles are there for a reason um and they will decompose over time uh, not to return and hopefully the frag doesn't come back either i hope so <laughs> hope not yeah karen in, in windsor uh one of the obvious places where a lot of people every day will see frag is along east hero expressway mm -hmm. uh, what control efforts and so forth would be appropriate uh along a highway like that yeah that's a good question carl and um I think we're learning in that sense to um, the MTO uh, would, and, and um, I think the city manages EC row, right? So it would be city employees, I guess that would be in charge of say mowing that, that stretch. Um, I think for one, they'd have to stop mowing to make sure whatever is there can be properly sprayed, but that would be a situation that you could spray it because it's dry enough. Right. So there are contractors in the province that are skilled to spray Phragmites along roadsides. Um, and, and that would be a case where the city would likely hire that out um, and bring in somebody expert in, and with the right equipment. Because on I think there's there's rules, right? And I think um, the EC rows, you can drive fast enough on it that you need a certain truck with the flashing lights. And, and I think it's like a traffic control situation but you know you just got to get halfway off the shoulder and then this equipment can it's like a boom truck and they just drive it along and have a hose and they'll spray from the truck um and just move along the, the these these highway systems so they do it on the mto right now um the mto highway i think uh the west region has been focusing on london to windsor for for years um and, and maybe maybe some of us have noticed that I certainly have um, the the highways getting much better um, in terms of frag 403 um, and you know, the 402 between London and Sarnia was controlled too and they they tend to rotate so it's not a perfect system <laughs> because while they're controlling other roads it's coming back over here so it's another one of these put out the fire situation but that's where that strategy is going to come in, I think, to really hopefully organize some of that. But yeah, it's like a boom truck and some uh, contractors. It's, it's the best way to, to handle those fast roads. Um, and I guess the last piece I would say is EC row infestation of frag is extending onto a lot of industrial land. So a good strategy there would be to reach out to some of those adjacent landowners and say, you know, we're coming through with this boom truck, you know, how do, would you want to work with us and, and what would that look like? Well, what's worrisome too about the uh, Greg Midas is the amount of turtles that get caught and die in it because it's so thick they can't get out. You know, it's wildlife that's endangered. Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely, um, turtles are particularly impacted by Phragmites. They can they just can't move through it. So it, it, it essentially is like a fence to them. Uh, coming back to individual municipalities, uh, uh, some of you people live in Amherstburg now. Uh, going back a few years ago, Bill Roselle did a, a manual survey of properties in Amherstburg uh, that were in, infested with uh, Frag. What what kind of progress, if any, has that municipality uh, actually achieved or engaged in? That what, would what, be sure. What, what are they doing? I mean, the, Bill worked for I don't know at least a summer. You know, going up and down all the different drains and so forth, trying to inventory everything, every last stand of uh, Frag that was down there. And I expected you know, Amherstburg to be a leader in terms of the county, in terms of what they were going to do. And so they must have done something, right? Corey, well, do you know of anything? 
I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, Carl. I'm not sure. Um, I think, I think, I mean, I, I, all I can say is behind my house, the Morgan drains up for cleaning and I got that notice. So I just let the drain superintendent know that there is some frag back there and to be careful because I didn't know. And then he wrote me back and said, they're really well aware of frag and they do actively manage it. So I don't know, that's all I know. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like. Sure. All right, are there any other questions for tonight? Well, Corey and Carol, I'm just wondering if um, there's not so many participants on because of the, I had a hard time getting on tonight. It was, it was a very different way of uh, uh, accessing the, it wasn't clear how to get on. Um, and my husband's a, my tech guy, so he had, a, and he's very good at this and he had a hard time. So I don't know. We'll, we'll um, mention that to the, the team to make sure the link is easier to click through. Yeah, easier because it wasn't highlighted how to tap on the, you know, the password, like all that, the usual stuff wasn't there. Okay. We will let the team know. Thanks for letting us know that. Thanks. I must have been lucky because I had no problems at all. Oh. At, and I, you know, seriously, uh, I think we would have had a much better turnout and so forth tonight for Karen if this would have been an in-person meeting. Definitely. Because we've talked about this before, and I think there's a fair amount of interest in the club as a whole with regard to what's going on with Frag. We should be really in the middle of a war with it right now, and uh, you know we're just sitting back and letting the, you know, the the, the other party kind of just take over, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. We're definitely make this presentation available on the YouTube channel, and we'll be sharing it with the members and as well as the public. So there's a lot of great information in tonight's presentation. Okay, so the public, uh, like friends of mine, can access it through the uh, YouTube then. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. And any of the past presentations that have done on, been done on Zoom, they're all available on our YouTube channel and open to the public. Oh, okay. C Corey, what has been the experience in previous months? You know, are you able to get stats in terms of how many views and so forth take place after the presentation? Yeah, we can we can see all of the views for each presentation. Some are more than others. Um, it just depends on the topic, and you know. Right. The, the, the interest, but uh, yeah, the, we've had good turnouts uh, after the fact as well. So that's, that's encouraging. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Karen. And thank you everyone for uh, tuning in tonight. Really appreciate that. And like I said, uh, this will be available later. So please share the presentation with your friends and family. Uh, the more we get this news out there, the better. So, mm -hmm. Again, thanks, Karen. Have a good night, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.